I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we continue to analyse Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow, bring you the latest from the front lines, and Dom Nichols interviews former US ambassador to the UN and former national security advisor, John Bolton. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 21st of March, one year and 25 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor Dominic Nichols, our assistant comment editor Francis Sternley, and senior foreign correspondent Roland Oliphant. I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from Ukraine. Well, hi David, hi everybody. So, Crimea, right in the centre of the north of Crimea. Crimea is sort of diamond shaped, so in the in the top of it, the pointy bit at the top, right in the centre, the um, town of Zhankoy. So Ukraine's defence ministry said yesterday that they had targeted a rail line in the area of Zhankoy and destroyed a train carrying a number of cruise missiles that Russia intended to use uh, by the Black Sea fleet. So Ukraine's defence ministry said they've destroyed a number of these missiles. An explosion, this is a quote, an explosion in Zhankoy city in the north of temporary occupied Crimea destroyed Russia calibre KN cruise missiles as they're being transported by rail, unquote. That was from the main intelligence director of Ukraine. So calibre we've seen a lot of. They are, we've seen them, they can be air launched or um, launched from maritime and subsurface, I think subsurface, but certainly from the surface Black Sea fleet, about a thousand mile range, a bit shorter at sea, but you know, very, very capable. The last of a dwindling stock of precision missiles. But uh, yeah, they were being transported. Russia said that there was no military target in the area and that, that, Russia, that Ukraine were attacking civilian targets. I mean, I, we, we can't verify what was hit elsewhere. I mean, the, the, it may well be that there was no no military barracks nearby or airfield or anything like that. But this train train line obviously goes elsewhere, so we don't know if there was any other any other damage. But it does seem like it was a, the reports are a successful strike. No idea on numbers yet of the of the caliber missiles destroyed. Separately, let's go up into the Donbass. So. Uh, Russia seemed to have been making very marginal gains around Bakhmut and Avdivka. Avdivka is further to the southwest. But firstly, in Bakhmut, they're moving around, seem to be moving around to the northwest and the southwest of the city. The high, that's higher ground there, so it confers, confers an advantage not only over the city centre itself, but also to the, those, the roads supplying Bakhmut, so out to the southwest and sort of northwest, really, the roads that are supplying Ukrainian forces in there. Down in Avdivka, Russia is reported to be using more aviation units, so more helicopters. They seem to be trying to mass helicopters there. And the local mayor, Vitaly Bar- Bar- Barabash, he said that they are, Russia, are increasingly using KH-59, 101, 555, they're all cruise missiles, and S-300 missiles in the area. Now, a Ukrainian military spokesperson said that Russia has lost in the area three companies worth. So infantry, they're still not they haven't got an advantage in armor at the moment. They're still going for very heavy infantry led tactics. But they say they've lost three companies worth. So that's about 200, 250 men since the week. And it's also thought that Ukraine are prioritizing rather than fighting for ground, they are prioritizing the forming and the training of new units in three army corps. So a corps is, well, normally sort of at least two divisions go out to make a corps, division being about 10,000. So corps are the big, big moving parts um, in a military force. So if this is if this is what's anticipated for the spring offensive, that that is very sizable. It's difficult to do that and also hold the front line. And it, it looks as if what Ukraine are suffering at the moment is is this balance between building up forces, holding back moot, not deploying any reserves. Reserves are the are the bit you've got up your sleeve for a for a rainy day or to, you know, to exploit success or plug a gap in the line. So they're very reluctant to use their reserves because 
once they're gone, it's gone, and, and it takes a while to recock that. But yes, we're seeing this tension at the moment, which which we don't know which way it's going to go. There's talk of Ukrainian positions falling back from back moot, but that doesn't seem to be the case. But yes, this balance between fighting and training is is the big tension at the moment with the with the Ukrainian forces. Now, a note from the ISW, the Institute for the Study of War, a US-based think tank, they have said that the, the recently experienced increased tempo of Russian operations around Avdivka um, has reportedly led to major losses. And ISW is suggesting this was a misguided effort, their words, misguided effort to pull Ukrainian forces away from other areas of the front. ISW goes on, they say it's unlikely that Russian forces will be able to sustain this temporary increased tempo. And they think that the Russian offensive, this spring offensive, is likely approaching a culmination point. Culmination, as we said before, is when you're still you're still very dangerous. You, you are not going backwards, but you just don't have the effort. You don't have the strength to go forwards anymore. So you, you're not able to keep pushing on. And hopefully you, you, you aim to culminate, all forces do, you aim to culminate when you've achieved your objectives and you can then hold on to that bit of ground or whatever the objective is you're after and then, and then um, resupply and reorganise and set for the next fight. But if you culminate before you've achieved your objectives, then, then it's, it's virtually useless. Um, and the ISW is saying that what we might be seeing at the moment around Bakhmut is Russian forces trying to intensify efforts to grab any marginal gains before they before they realise they, they, they have to go firm, they culminate and they can't they can't go any any further forward. Just one final note from um, from ISW. They're saying that the Wagner sorry, not the ISW, this comes from today's UK Defence Intelligence Brief. They're saying that just on that point of, of tempo that, that the ISW were making. They're saying that the Wagner Group are. They seem to be sticking to this to this contract that the that they made with the with Russian prison population that come and serve with Wagner for six months, and uh, you have your have your sentences quashed. That seems to be the deal. Of course, you know many of them are are being are being killed, but they seem to be sticking to the deal that after six months they uh, they can go back home. Now, ally that to the recent news that Wagner has been denied the right to recruit further from Russian prisons and put, put together with the casualties that we know they've they've taken. And it means that, that Wagner are suffering. And of course, the any tactical gains we've seen in recent months have been largely by this group. I mean, it's not been the Russian regular forces. So if they are culminating and if they're not able to recruit, and if those people, if they are honouring, which I'm surprised at to be perfectly honest, but if they are honouring this contract to let people go back home after six months, then that's not great news for Wagner. And just very finally, before I, before I hand over, on the Wagner, there was a, a background brief with a Western official this morning. I wasn't able to attend for reasons we'll talk about in a moment, but Joe Barnes did. And on the Wagner group, they um, the message from the Western official was that Wagner, which numbered about 5,000 fighters before the invasion last year, this phase of the war started last year, they then recruited about 45,000 people from prisons under the, the deal I've just outlined. And they've taken about 20,000 casualties, a casualty being dead, wounded, prisoner or missing. So you know, there's about half the force left. And those that are left are largely from the prison population. The, the dare I say, it, professional or more experienced professional, as in they used to be in Russian service, not that they are acting in a professional manner, but they've, they've had some measure of training that cohort in Wagner is much, much reduced. So they are still going forward at great cost. The fight is still happening in and around Bakhmut, but Wagner, which seems to have been the only really effective, and that's marginal, effective force Russia have been able to put in the field in recent months, looks like they are coming towards a culmination point. They are struggling with manpower, and we know there are internal difficulties with Wagner getting hold of ammunition, in particular artillery, from Russian uh, Russian forces. I'll take a breather there. Thank you very much for that, Dom. Francis Sternley, it's great to have you back on the on the pod. We've missed you for a few days and an awful lot has happened. So can you talk us through some of the updates you've been looking at? Well, thank you, David. Yes. On Friday, you asked me what was the realistic best case and worst case scenario for Xi's ongoing visit to Moscow. The best case was that China would be cautious in its rhetoric, playing down their relationship with Russia and playing up Xi's role as an international peacemaker. 
the worst case was that we would see further tangible support to Russia, including the possibility of heavy weapons. Now, there's been no public declaration on the latter yet, but I think we are unfortunately seeing China overtly strengthening its support for Russia, albeit in a manner that still seeks to portray China as a peacemaker in the matter of Ukraine. We hear today that Putin and Xi will sign more than 10 documents to foster relations between Russia and Moscow relating to, quote, energy, military, technical cooperation, trade and economic cooperation. Now, we don't know any more details, but the military technical cooperation sounds rather ominous to me. I should mention in that context that the New York Times are reporting today that China has sold more than $12 million worth of drones and drone parts to Russia since the invasion began. These shipments are a mixture of products from a Chinese tech company, the world's largest and best known drone maker and smaller companies. Now, I should stress that this is different to the Chinese state directly giving weapons in the manner that we've seen Western company, countries donate tanks. But it is an example, I think, of where weapons may be being given to Russia through the back door. This, of course, comes off the back of the Politico report last week, reporting that guns from China were also being funneled into Russia. Bear in mind, however, that neither these drones or these guns are the kind of game changers on the battlefield compared to, say, the American HIMARS. But nonetheless, it is, of course, significant. I think perhaps the most concerning thing we've heard today, however, is that Xi has invited Putin to visit China this year, according to local media reports. So Xi said, I invite President Putin to visit China this year at a time that is convenient for him. And he also described Beijing and Moscow as great neighbouring partners and strategic partners, saying that he would prioritise ties with Putin. Now, in terms of specific conversations relating to Ukraine, we understand that there was a thorough exchange of views during their first day of talks. And there was an extensive discussion of the peace plan put forward by Beijing, which, of course, we discussed at length several weeks ago. That's, of course, been roundly dismissed by the United States and others because China has essentially in that peace plan refused to condemn Russia's invasion and have said that any ceasefire resulting from it would just lock in Russian territorial gains and give give Putin's army more time to regroup. What's interesting as well is just the way that the Chinese media are reporting all of this. So, as I say, there's a lot of rhetoric around China playing this kind of international peacemaker role. Sophia Yan, of course, a regular on this podcast, has written a piece on this on our website where she goes into detail, summarising some of the nature of the reporting, which is fascinating. Chinese state media talking about China upholding true multilateralism, talking about how the world has suffered terribly because of the egotistic and self-serving United States, because of the conflict the Ukrainians have lost hugely, says One Piece. To be the responsible major country, the United States should stop being the destroyer of peace and creator of crisis, shift to the right side of history and help bring this disaster to an end. So that's the kind of rhetoric and the kind of tone that we're seeing. And of course, to play up to this, China has already confirmed that she will talk to Zelensky for the first time after this visit though we understand that no details yet have been further confirmed and the Ukrainian government have said they're still waiting to hear more. So overall, with regard to China, it's a pretty depressing picture, I think, from a Western perspective, especially following the ICC arrest warrant for Putin that we obviously heard about regarding war crimes on Monday. I did wonder whether it would tone down, tone down Xi's commitments. And for all we know, it has. But the real significance, of course, of the warrant from the ICC is that other countries, governments on the fence regarding the war may now adapt their dealings with Putin, if nothing else, because of the potential consequences on them if they were to go further in their support. I note, for instance, there's been some debate in South Africa, although I think in that context, I should add that previously in Africa generally, there has been anger about the perceived Western bias of the ICC. There was a special African Union summit in 2015, I think, to discuss, discuss the withdrawal. And that concluded with it arguing that heads of state should not be put on trial. I should also add as well that there are listeners who will probably think listening and saying that does this mean that Putin can't travel? It doesn't mean that. There are instances where world leaders deemed war criminals by the ICC have not been arrested 
arrested by countries signed up for the ICC. So unfortunately, it is symbolic, but it still matters. Putin has been marked with something indelible and leaders will never think about him in the same way. And I think most importantly of all, it draws attention, of course, to the main charge here, which is relating to children, which we have covered at length on the podcast, these instances of kidnapping taking place. And so in, if nothing else, it drawing attention to that and international attention to that, I think is very welcome. I'll take a pause there, David. There is more to talk about on the diplomatic field, but I'm conscious I've been talking for quite a bit there. So maybe we can return to, to the other news later on. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Francis. Roland, it's really good to have you back on. We hope you had a good, good rest in your week off. You've been looking at Xi's visit to Moscow. How do you see what's going on? What, what, what's your analysis there? I think a lot of it's theatre, to be absolutely honest. I mean, there, there's there, there's a certain amount of context to understand here. Like, she always goes to Moscow for his his first visit. He did it when he first became president. He's he's made frequent visits to Moscow, and this is he probably would have been making a big show of going to Moscow to see his ally anyway, regardless of the war at some point. But of course, regardless of all that, regardless of the fact that these are two superpowers, two permanent members of the UNSC with a long border and a huge amount of discussion notwithstanding the war or anything else, the war is clearly dominating everything. I think there's been a little bit of a canard put out there by people asking the question, I suppose it's a legitimate question, um, Can is, is he intending to stop the war? Is he is he aiming to, to be a, a peace broker? Is he aiming to repeat this quite interesting little Chinese diplomatic coup uh, the other week where they, they brokered a very surprising rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Is that what we're, we're going to see coming out of this? That to me was always seemed, you know, somewhat dubious. And I'll allow the reasons why. W- one reason is that if you read the 12 point peace plan the Chinese have put forward, and which um, the Kremlin said was discussed at length over dinner last night by Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi, it is, I mean, it's fluff. Basically, it's it's it, it contains almost nothing concrete whatsoever. It, it talks about respect sovereignty, respect civilians, and um, protect the rights of prisoners of war, find a ceasefire. Kind of, it, it was almost like it was written by a kind of a well-meaning peace activist who who hasn't actually got any ideas how to achieve this stuff. Um, which, on the one hand, that's that's quite cunning. It allows lots of people to read into it what they want. And the Russians can certainly read that and say, aha, the Chinese are backing us and everything we want. It's quite easy to read that and kind of, if you want to, read into China kind of backing the Western view, kind of putting a shot across the bow by say, of, of Russia by saying we don't approve of, of the use of nuclear weapons or threatening to use it. But but, but the truth is, it's, it's a way of basically saying nothing and, and staying on the fence um, and... And, and you would do that, quite frankly, because Xi Jinping is not a man who wants to be seen to fail. And although he has a great deal of sway in Moscow, if you know, to, there, he does not have any carrot or stick, as far as I can tell, that would bridge the gap, uh, break, you know, cut that Gordian knot, which has defied every single peacemaker from the outside who's come to this over the past 12, 13, 14 months, which is that neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians can live with the kind of concessions that the other side would expect. If he really wanted to twist Putin's arm and say, listen, you rely on us, mate. Get real about this. Uh, this war is, is bad for you. It's bad for China. It's bad for the world. Take some kind of deal. Withdraw most of your troops. I'll twist the Ukrainian arms and get them to agree to Crimea. Something like that. Maybe he could give it a shot, but I can't actually see either the Russians or the Ukrainians agreeing to that. And he'd have egg on his face. It would basically be attempting the impossible. So I think, I think all the talk of kind of a proposed peace formula is uh, smoke and mirrors. It, it's a bit of theatre, but your theatre is important. So there's a reason that it's a three day visit that they're making a big song and dance about it. It it shows China very visibly backing Russia in the war diplomatically, if not. Uh, directly militarily and that 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 is significant because of course this war is no longer really it never was really i suppose just about a conflict between ukraine and russia it has international aspects the prime minister of japan is in kiev today for example exactly when the, the president of china shows up in moscow that that also is a is a sign that that is a signal to beijing from the japanese very symbolic quite important i also am skeptical about talk about kind of military supplies from China to Russia. The Americans are obviously quite worried about it. They seem to have obtain, obtained some intelligence, we think, from Russian sources rather than from the Chinese end, suggesting the Chinese are mulling or considering a Russian request to deliver weapons. I was on that call with a Western official 
earlier today who kind of poured cold water on the speculation said look yes there are there are social media reports of mortar shells with chinese writing showing up but it's a it's a pretty big international arms market out there it's pretty easy to get hold of stuff and just because you've got a certain kind of writing on a shell that really doesn't mean that a, a certain government is supplying stuff so western officials being very cautious about attributing any intention on that score to china at the moment but i think the big thing's money really the russians need money they need business russian companies are already uh see you know or already sourcing things like micro ships and machine tools just talking about drones from chinese companies rather than from western ones the things that are under sanction and the other thing is is oil and gas revenue which makes up about what 40 ish percent of russian budget revenues so the big thing that will be discussed today between the russians and the chinese in moscow is this proposed pipeline from western siberia into china um which would massively expand gas exports and which the russians would hope would somewhat offset the fall in revenues they're going to see from from the west trying to wean themselves from those from from russian sources the, the flip side of that is of course is that there aren't many other customers around the chinese are going to be able to force a pretty hard bargain but bottom line yes i think i think china is is very clearly showing you know which side it stands on in this conflict i don't think that mr putin is going to get all the help he wants that's fascinating thank you roland just one question from me we had james kilner on the podcast yesterday and he he mentioned how over the past couple of days putin's visit to occupied mariupol and crimea that he hadn't really seen the russian president look so confident and engaged before in this in in, in this war um i was just wondering what your thoughts on there were what what are your thoughts on putin's behavior and his, his sort of comportement over over the last over, over this chinese visit and and the days before I think it's got to boost your boost your confidence when you've got probably the second most powerful individual on the planet visiting you and and making a show of support to you. And and Mr. Putin is going to hope that when he waves Mr. Xi off on well tomorrow morning that he's 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 secured some kind of concrete support that he's secure in the knowledge of Chinese backing and you know that that's going to make him walk a bit straighter with his shoulders back and, and, and feel a bit more cocky. We don't yet know if you'll get that by the end of these talks. And I think the trip to Mariupol, we haven't really seen Putin going into these so-called liberated areas. Um, so I, I think that was the timing was definitely interesting, um, probably definitely slightly aimed at the Chinese to show, you know, I'm, I'm a war leader, this is what I'm doing. We've liberated the areas, showing himself off. So it's 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 helpful having the Chinese on side. It it do, it is going to give him, you know, some kind of I don't know, you know, like kind of wind in your sails that that makes you feel better. And you know, everyone has a good day where where you feel like things are going well. You know, he, he needs those days because the war is not going that well. And he's going to be the, the way I kind of look at Russia's approach to the war is that it's, you know, they're looking for each next threshold down the road where 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 something might go right they're probably hanging on to one of them is the american election next year i'm fairly sure they're kind of thinking well you know we get there republicans win maybe western support falls away and she's visit is one of those points i'm not sure it signifies anything more than that and i'd be very leery of talking about kind of i don't know body language and, and, and Vladimir Putin looking cocky or looking dejected because he has his mood swings and sometimes you'll see him slouched and kind of looking a bit irritated with the world and everyone around him and sometimes you'll see him, you know, looking chipper. Um, but no one has ever been able to, to use that as far as I know to kind of distill what is really going on inside his head or inside the Kremlin. That's fair enough. Thank you, Roland. Just quickly, on this visit from Chi to Moscow over the past two days. Is there anything, I mean, you, you described it as mainly theatre. Is there anything that surprised you at all or was different to how you expected? I suppose I wasn't sure what I expected. I think the point is that there's there's an awful lot of, you know, bells and whistles on this. And both sides are really going out of their way to advertise the, the closeness of the friendship, the, the partnership. And you had one of the Moscow tabloids yesterday was you know published a, a, an early cold war era propaganda poster and said look at this this poster is relevant again you know 
square jawed Soviet worker next to square jawed Chinese worker. And what, you know, that was in the fifties before the Sino Soviet split and, and that so called friendship all went very, very badly wrong. But a huge amount of, of, of singing and dancing, these two mutual articles that both men published in, in each other's national newspapers, praising the, the depth of their partnership and the, the unlimited nature of their brotherhood and choose your 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 metaphor and, and all of this so the i come back to theater a, a huge a huge point is being made here and the point is that we are together well, how much concrete support there is behind that theater is one thing but the chinese are certainly making clear whose side they're on and i think ultimately the message to the west is that we can build alliances too and it's certainly not in china's interests to see russia lose this war and i think that that is something that you know certain western commentators should should definitely take on board because there's definitely you know a lot of talk throughout the war of oh you know the chinese are ambivalent they're not pleased with what putin's doing etc etc well maybe they are a bit ambivalent but at the end of the day this is your ally your ally's in trouble and it is not it's not in your interest to see them lose Thank you very, very much for that, Roland. Roland mentioned there the surprise visit of the Japanese Prime Minister to Kiev today. Francis, you've been looking at that. Do you want to just update us on that story before we go to all of your final thoughts? Yes, this is a very significant story. A surprise visit, as you say, from the Japanese Prime Minister. The significance, of course, being all about the timing, coinciding with Xi being in Russia. This is an attempt by the Japanese Prime Minister to stake his place on the world stage for one but not only that of course it, it really matters for the the west more broadly saying you know it's not not only chi who's going to dominate the headlines in the coming days because it's quite noteworthy images already coming through it's literally happening as we speak footage uh, shown has shown mr kashida walking along the platform of kiev central station or escorted by a few people who appear to be ukrainian officials he's also i understand as we speak visiting butcher as well somewhere which would be very well known to listeners. Uh, He said uh, that his visit will show an absolute rejection of Russia's one-sided change to the status quo by invasion and force. And I think it's also important to contextualise this is that Japan has territorial disputes over Ireland with both China uh, and Russia and is particularly concerned about the close relationship between Beijing and Moscow, which has conducted joint military exercises near Japan's coast. Japan has consistently shown unwavering support for Ukraine against this sort of back drop of anxiety in Asia that a win for Putin would inspire China potentially to make an aggressive move to advance its own territorial ambitions, perhaps in Taiwan, and inevitably then drawing neighbouring nations into the fight. So a really significant intervention. And I think I'm right in saying this is the first time that a Japanese prime minister has visited a country at war. Now, I'm sure that uh, other listeners, if I'm wrong, will correct me, but I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that. So an important moment. I just wanted also just to um, add as well that two Russian strategic bomber planes are currently flying over the Sea of Japan. And I think we can read into that, that this is Russia's response to the the decision of the Japanese prime minister to do this. It's just an attempt to say, we know what you're doing and you know, we've got the capabilities, as it were, just this kind of diplomatic tip, tip for tat, but nonetheless, I think significant. And all, lastly, I want to just pick up something that Roland was saying there, which is that it's not in China's infl- interest for Russia to fail. I do think that at this stage of the conflict, that is true, given where we are. But that may change. And I, what I mean by that is that if China sees that Putin is on the way out and that maybe there's even more greater threats for the stability of the Russian state, there are opportunities for China, opportunities in some of its sort of territories in the east in terms of China getting more influence there. A a, a Russia in turmoil may have opportunities for the Chinese state and may even lead to Russia becoming more of a vassal state of China in the long term. So I don't disagree with Roland's analysis. I I wish to underline that, but rather just to point out that that the picture may change if the military situation deteriorates for Russia. And it may be one where China actually can benefit from that. So as ever, we'll watch this space. Before we hear the panel's final thoughts, earlier today, we were joined at the Telegraph offices by John Bolton. Ambassador Bolton has held many positions in the American government during his lifetime. He's been ambassador to the UN, and he's a former national security advisor. 
he sat down with our Associate Editor for Defence, Dom Nichols. Here is their conversation. Mr Bolton, welcome to The Telegraph. Thank you very much for spending the time with us here. Now, Xi Jinping is in Moscow today. We hear this morning he has invited Vladimir Putin back to China later on this year. What would it mean for China's standing in the world if President Xi were to offer heavy weapons or sophisticated technology for Russia's war effort in Ukraine? Well, to begin with, I think China's been supportive of Russia from the outset of this war 13 months ago. A lot of analysts in the West have said China is embarrassed by Russia. It's trying to separate itself from Russia. That's simply not true. They have been providing economic support, buying Russian oil and gas, facilitating movement of Russian finances through the Chinese system. The West has made a major point to say they don't want China to supply weapons, and China so far has said that it wouldn't. But there are a lot of ways to accomplish the same objective without actually shipping the weapons selling weapons to Belarus and then transfers them to Russia or to North Korea, providing components of weapon systems, if not the whole system, simply providing fungible assets, money in particular, that takes the pressure off Russia. I think when China and Russia both say this is an alliance with no limits, I think they mean it. That's the real problem for the West, no matter what happens in Ukraine. Now, there's been a lot of talk about vital interests from the US point of view recently, Ron DeSantis's comment. Is Europe a vital interest for the United States, would you say? And have the actions by Europeans in the wake of this war shown that the US has sufficient military force in Europe to protect those interests? Well, I think Ukraine is a vital interest for the United States. And in fact, since 1945, we've considered peace and security in Europe as a vital American interest. So when part of it is threatened in Ukraine, even though it's not a NATO member, other NATO members are affected. I I thought Ron DeSantis' comment was very disappointing. I'm hoping it was purely political in nature and therefore can be revised. I don't think it's a reflection of of where the bulk of the Republican Party is on support for Ukraine. But I think there is a continuing question about the resolve of some European countries and whether Putin can play on that lack of resolve to achieve politically what his forces have not been able to achieve militarily. There's a risk of that in the United States, too. People forget that there are splits within the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. But I think this should be a wake-up call, and I think Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow makes it even clearer. The West has got to think in global terms for its own security, that a threat in Ukraine is one aspect, a threat to Taiwan is another aspect. And what we're all doing, what our military capabilities are, what our defense industrial base looks like, all should be on the table and I think will be in the United States in the 2024 election. Now, in your December 2021 article entitled, Now is the Time for NATO to Stand Up to Russia, you call for an aggressive response to Moscow's build up, then build up on the, on the Ukraine border. How much more could and should NATO have done to deter Russia from invading Ukraine last February? Well, I don't think President Biden did much to try and deter Russia. He said, in fact, on a number of occasions, he didn't think we could deter Russia. I think that's flatly wrong. I think, among other things, we could have imposed significant sanctions on Russia before the invasion. People said at the time, but that will just prompt Russia to invade. Well, they they did, so how could it have been worse? The fact is, we all failed after 2014 to take a meaningful response. And I think that weakness in 2014 was a significant factor in Russian decision-making that if they tried it again in Ukraine, they'd get the same response. Deterrence requires thinking about the strategy. It's not simply putting weapons into the hands of a potential target. It's, it's a much more important question. And I think as we see China emerging as a threat in the nuclear field as well as conventional, that we need to do a lot more conceptual thinking in the West about deterrence. We did a lot in the 1950s and 1960s. Fortunately, it worked. There was no exchange of nuclear weapons. We're in a different tripartite nuclear world now, and China's a major conventional force too. So this has gotten more complicated. I think we've got to put behind us what we thought when the Soviet Union fell, that history had ended. History has not ended, and it's very threatening to us. Sounds like you're leaning towards the the idea that that NATO is brain dead. Well, I think it's gone quiet for too long. And the invasion of Ukraine, which is a tragedy for Ukraine, ought to be a wake-up call to the rest of us. Uh, I think NATO's response has been 
good, but a lot less than what it needs to be. And so this is, this is a time really to have a broader discussion about what are the threats we're facing. It's not simply the threat of Russia. That threat is blunted in Ukraine. It has not been defeated, but its performance has been less than menacing. It's really the China-Russia axis, which is what I think it's becoming, with outriders like Iran and North Korea. Look at a map, look at the geography. This is something we've got to take seriously. Now, you've dealt with Putin directly. I'm interested in your assessment of him. If we, if we accept that he has been acting rationally, his version of rationally up to now, is there room left for that rationality? Or what does that look like going forward from now? Well, I think Putin might actually welcome what Xi Jinping is doing with the so-called peace plan, which is very tilted toward Russia. I think Putin could use a reprieve from this conflict to regroup, restock, re-equip, retrain his forces. But I think Putin, people have tried to psychoanalyze him and say that he's, he's sort of lost the plan. I think he just has a different logic. I recall he has said several times to me after we've debated some arms control issue, well, you have your logic, we have ours, we'll see who prevails. For Russia, and it's not just Putin, it's many Russians, Ukraine is part of the Russian Empire, not even the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire. They believe the Soviet Union was illegitimately ripped apart by the U.S. and the West as a whole, and they aim to put it together. They place a very high value on that. They place a lower value on human life than we do. We, we don't agree with that approach, but that's their logic, and it's not the same as ours. Now, you served as the 25th United States ambassador to the United Nations, 2005-2006. How would you rate the U.N.'s response to the invasion? Well, there essentially is no response. There's certainly been humanitarian work, and, and I think we all support that. But the political decision-making bodies of the U.N. are broken and have been for some time. And in particular, the Security Council is broken. You've got two permanent members, Russia and China, who have interests antithetical to the other three permanent members, France, Britain, and the U.S. As we had gridlock during the Cold War, when the Security Council was mostly irrelevant, I think we're in the same kind of period going forward. So the idea that the UN, as the League of Nations before it, is an answer to threats to peace and security, I think has been clearly answered in the negative. Uh, looking a bit more domestically, you've said Donald Trump is, and I quote, the, dem the Democratic Party's best asset will almost guarantee a Democratic win, and Democrats want to see him nominated as the Republican nominee. How can you be so certain? Because he did surprise the world before. Well, I'm saying from the Democrats' point of view, they'd rather run against Trump than almost anybody else. That, that's not to say they would win. They're, they may well be overconfident. That's why I'm worried, and I think it's legitimate to worry, that if Trump is indicted, whether it's on the Stormy Daniels matter or any criminal investigations ongoing, if he's indicted but not convicted, that will be rocket fuel to his campaign. And I am worried about that. I do not want to see Donald Trump as the Republican nominee, not just for the good of the Republican Party, but for the good of the country. And if there is trouble today in New York regarding the possible arrest of Donald Trump over the Stormy Daniels affair, affair how much responsibility would you put at the feet of Mr. Trump? Well, I think he has learned the lesson of January the 6th, and he's calling people into the streets. What the response will be, I don't know. I think at least some Republican leaders have said people should not demonstrate in his favor, and, and I think that's a step forward. But uh, Trump has uh, literally no limits on what he's capable of doing, and uh, I think we need to be very wary about that. The Republican Party has to cleanse itself of, of what the damage Trump has done to it. This is really our responsibility. It's not going to come from the liberal media. It's not going to come from the Democrats. Republicans have to do this, and this is the moment we need to rise to. And on your own, own ambitions here, you've not yet declared whether you'll, you'll stand in the, in the general election 2024. How damaging do you think it might be your, your service in the Trump administration as the National Security Advisor, how, how potentially damaging do you think that, that could be if you do decide to run? Well, I don't think it would be damaging. I mean, I wrote a 500-page book to explain what happened uh, during my time in the administration. I've made my views on Trump clear. I'm, I'm still in the consideration stage. I'm, I'm not going to run unless I think I've got a chance to win, and it's a, it's a very serious decision. But I think the danger of a Trump nomination needs to call forth uh, extra effort from all of us, and, and that's what I'm looking at. And just to finish, if we may, by going back to Ukraine, what do you say to those people that say there's a moral equivalence between the West's intervention in, in Iraq 20 years ago this week and Vladimir Putin's actions in Ukraine? 
there's no moral equivalence at all. Wh whether you agree with the Iraq decision or not, it was based on the belief that Saddam Hussein was a threat to international peace and security. He had invaded Kuwait 10 years before. He had used chemical weapons against the Kurds, his own fellow citizens. He was perfectly capable of getting weapons of mass destruction and giving them to terrorists. It was to remove a threat to peace and security in the region and globally that we made the decision we did. As I say, you can agree or disagree with it, but the motives were proper. Vladimir Putin's motives were simply recreation of the Russian Empire. After his predecessor, the only democratically elected president in the history of Russia signed an agreement that the Soviet Union would break up along the lines of the Republic borders. And that is what Vladimir Putin is challenging. And finally, are we already in Cold War II and how does this war end? Well, I think it's still in its early stages, but one thing I think that's important about Xi Jinping's effort to form a really strong alliance with Russia is that China today is a Marxist country. There was a period when Deng Xiaoping began his economic reforms, you could say, it was still authoritarian, but it was moving away from Marxism. That, that began to change, and under Xi Jinping, it's clear this is a Marxist government. It's not the Marxism of the 20th century, but it's Marxist in its orientation and authoritarian. That means inevitably, if it continues in this direction, that it will be a Cold War. And how's the war end? Well, I think it could be a long struggle. I think for the U.S. and the West as a whole, China is the existential threat. It's not just a threat in Asia. I think that's important for people to understand. It's a threat in the Middle East. We've just seen it manifested in the deal it's brokered between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. And it's a threat in Europe, as we see from its support uh, for Rus Russia's position. So people need to think beyond the end of history, which uh, turns out not to be right, and to think what we're going to do to enhance our collective security. Mr. Bolton, thanks very much for your time with The Telegraph. Glad to be with you. Well, thank you very much, Roland, Dom and Francis, for all of that. Can I just get your final thoughts? And um, Dom, I know you've had an interesting interview today. Do you want to just, just reflect a little bit on what, on, on what was said? Well, I thought it was interesting. That for somebody who has not yet declared if they're going to make a presidential run... He certainly covered all the bases you would expect. So he came straight out of the blocks and he was critical of President Biden, saying they had not done much to deter Russia and said that, I, mean, I don't know the speech he was referring to, but when he said that Biden said, oh, there's not, not much we could have done to deter Russia. And Mr. Bolton said, that's flatly wrong. I mean, a very definitive statement. Um, but he also, he, he, he absolutely positioned himself squarely in the Republican Party and away from Donald Trump. So he was very clear on the limits of the United Nations, saying they're, they're broken and the Security Council is, is back to the old days of being mostly irrelevant. I mean, very, very clear there. And then he was also, he went to great pains to distance himself from Donald Trump. When I asked him about whether or not he could be you know, accused of hypocrisy for serving as his national security advisor. You know, he's very clear, came straight out and said, no, no, I've written a 500-page book about why he was there and why he left. And then he backs it up with some really quite colourful language. I mean, when he says that the Republican Party had to, has to cleanse itself of the damage Trump has done to it, I mean, that you know, these are quite, he's not pulling any punches here. You're not going to be able to walk back from there. And then, as I say, for somebody who's who's yet to declare, I thought it was very telling his 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 sign off by saying um i mean you'd, you'd expect i'm not going to run unless i've got a chance to win unless i think i'm, I'm going to win or, or whatever whatever he said of course of course not a very serious decision yes yes it is and then when he said i think the danger big red word there danger of a trump nomination needs to call forth extra effort from all of us and that's what i'm looking at i mean again very very clear you could say that's a message to other members of the Republican Party, other people who come from the, the, the background he does, so not the sort of recent machinations of the, uh, of the party since Donald Trump has been in, involved at the, the most senior level. But equally, I mean, that, those are fairly clear statements of intent, I think. Whether or not he'd have any, he'd have any, um, any backing, I, I don't know. He's certainly got the gravitas and the experience. Whether or not he's got the razzmatazz, we have to have to wait and see and, and that does you know that does matter but no i thought it was very very clear that for someone who like i say has yet to declare 
he went a, went a long way around saying what his future intentions could well be. Thank you very much for that, Dom. Shall we go to Francis next? Francis Stanley. Well, thanks, David. It's very interesting hearing Bolton's remarks about the UN and specifically the UN Security Council, because shockingly, Russia is set to assume the chair of the Security Council within the next, I think it's week or so. And so we're in a situation here why, but whereby being members of the UN, of course, this thing goes cyclically around the table, as it were, that Russia will be in an opportunity to chair the council, which means that they can set the agenda, make appointments, and at the very least will use up time that could be being used to discuss other issues where there to be other countries in charge of the presidency at that moment. That is, of course, a concern. I should say that, as we've talked about on the podcast previously, there are some who argue that Russia should actually have no right to be on the UN Security Council, that it used to be the Soviet Union that was on it, and that it never apply, formally applied, the, the Russia, Russian Federation, and so actually it has no right to be there. That's the Ukrainian argument, and that they say they're occupying the seat of the Soviet Union. That's a direct quote. But I, as I say before, I think the reason why that has persisted, Russia's being on the council, is because actually for everything, despite everything, it's still deemed important to be able to have dialogues with Russia, maybe not in the public forum of the UN, but with these diplomats being there, it means that there can be back back door conversations. And if they weren't on the UN, then it would be much harder for those conversations to take place between diplomats. But nonetheless, it is a concern. It does seem absolutely farcical that one can be in a situation where you've just had an arrest warrant issued for Putin by the ICC, and yet within a matter of days that uh, Russia will be steering the UN Security Council. I mean, you couldn't make it up, but that's diplomacy for you. Thank you very much, Dom and Francis. Roland Oliphant, would you like the very final words? I think, once again, a lot of what we're talking about comes back to the the question of attrition, quite honestly. I mean, we were talking earlier about, I think it was Francis mentioning, China has developed, the, 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 sorry, Chinese companies have sold some phenomenal number of commercial drones to Russia, and that's not the Chinese government. But those things are, you know, basically usable at the front we all know how a quadcopter can be you know you can fix a grenade on it and off it goes everything that is happening now at the front is is basically being dictated in that good old-fashioned war of attrition way by factories by production by scale it's why the ukrainians are begging for more shells from europe it's why the russians are asking the chinese for more economic help and i it just the, the ft has this interesting quote from an anonymous source who claims to be close to the kremlin um the Russians are also thinking in in the long term, and, and they have been for some time about this war. The quote was, someone close to the Kremlin, the logic of events dictates we fully become a Chinese resource colony. Our services will be from Huawei. We will be China's major suppliers of everything. They'll get gas from power of Siberia. That's that pipeline I was talking about. By the end of 2023, the yuan will be our main trade currency. Now, that sounds slightly hyperbolic to me, but this is basically what we're in, I think. We're in a very, a very serious war of attrition, where... Both sides are doing everything they can to pull resources from every single place they can find them to gain that edge on the battlefield. And the assumption is from Moscow, and I think the assumption you have to take from from, from this big Chinese visit is that this is going to go on for some years. Um, and of course, they're sending that signal so that you know Ukrainian its allies lose heart. The same signal is being sent by Ukrainian its allies will be there as long as it takes. So I, I'm not sure what your guys' kind of future career or family development plans are, but you might want to consider 10 years sitting in this studio running this podcast. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest or sign up to Dispatches our Ukraine newsletter which brings stories from our award winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox we also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast you can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter spaces follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it to our listeners on YouTube Please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. 
You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Rachel Duffy. <laughs>